for our next talk. Never know. We have our interviewer, Steve Edwards okay. from Columbia University, interviewing Dave Haney and Andy Finkel, Commodore engineers, former Commodore engineers, talking about Amiga. Thank you, guys. So this is this is wonderful. I get to sit next to, uh, uh, to Commodore Amiga hardware and Commodore Amiga software, uh, and we'll ask. It. So, uh, but to begin with, um, uh, Andy, you've got a bunch of stuff prepared on the the history of, of how uh, Amiga came into Commodore. Yeah, sort so, of. Right? Okay. Sort of. Great. Um, so I, Bill Hurd asked me to you know to do this a couple months ago. And I figured, yeah, I do these all the time, you know, so it's, I'll just riff on something for half an hour or whatever. And a couple weeks ago, I realized, hey, I haven't done one of these things in like 10 years, 20 years. So I'm kind of nervous. So I actually went ahead and prepared something. So I'm not, I'm not riffing. I looked up uh, like two weeks ago on the VCF website uh, for what this, this whole thing was about. And I said, huh, Amiga Custom Chips. I had no idea that was what they wanted me to talk about. So, and at this point, it's been like, you can Google anything you want to know about the Amiga custom chips that I could possibly tell you. And in fact, I, to prepare for this, I would have had to Google it myself. So I just different because, uh, well, I wanted to do something unique, uh, something that you can't get from the web right now. So now for something completely different. I came up with two ideas. One is the history of Commodore through t-shirts. I have a really extensive t-shirt collection from, uh, you know, like, here's one of the original Commodore t-shirts. Uh, this was before, well, anyone knew anything. It says, Commodore supports its floppies. Is it me or is that shirt small? It's small. <laughs> and it's not in men's style either. I, I, I didn't know if it was the 70s or the smaller. <laughs> Yeah, Commodore, light years ahead. Ooh, uh, let's see. But I, I decided that, you know, that, that's, have you seen the Amiga, you know? <laughs> Commodore was not really great at uh, coming up with original t-shirts. Co Com Commodore in the U.S. had the worst swag. You go to Canada, you go to Germany, you get yeah. some great swag. They, they had all kinds of stuff. Uh, and this is a classic. God isn't this exciting. It offends <laughs> almost everybody. <laughs> So I, I rejected that idea after going through, you know, just a few of the top ones. Do, do you have a Jackbusters t-shirt? I have a Jackbusters t-shirt. Uh, let's see if I brought it. Um, uh, yes, yes, I did. It's a classic. <laughs> wow. Very few of these actually exist. <laughs> And Jack actually knew we called the game that. You know, he, he didn't mind. So my other option uh, was to tell the story about the, of the Amiga acquisition from the uh, Commodore point of view. Uh, co the Amiga acquisition was like a deep, deep dark secret, done very fast, um, but even by Commodore standards. And Commodore time was not like any other time. I mean, we did so much so quickly, it's like amazing how fast something like this happened. The, uh, I think it was like from May to August is when the entire period of buying the Amiga and integrating it into merging Commodore and Amiga. So what year was this? Uh, 1984. Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's a scary thing. It's a, so you were you were at Commodore first. I was, I was at Commodore. I was I've been a, was in Commodore forever. I was you know started with the VIC 20, uh, then went th through the uh, Commodore 64, went through the Plus 4, went through the LCD machine, went through the C128. Um, there's probably a couple others I'm forgetting. Uh, it's a but, dizzying collection of it. Okay. It was a yeah a lot. So that's, it's been like 40 years and you know, trying to get, figure out and remember the exact schedule of when things happened, that's something I'm not usually good at. But in this case, I have uh, high-tech weapons, engineering notebooks. Back then, <laughs> every engineer had to keep 
engineering notebooks, you wrote everything you did on them, the pages cannot be removed without uh, causing, getting a mess. And uh, I actually have engineering, all the engineering notebooks from that period, so I can actually tell what happened when. Um, I worked for Sig Hartman back then, and I was his, well, I was manager of uh, the application software group, uh, but he was, I was also his technical go-to guy, so I actually got to hear about all the uh, high-tech things because Sig wanted to find out and run, ask, get opinions about what other managers and division heads were telling him, whether it was real or not. So I would hear about a lot of things. I would actually go to engineering meetings, even though I was in the software department, software division. Uh, so I got to hear a lot of the, the back story behind stuff like this. So let's see. Got that one. Got. Okay, so this was just before any of the Amiga stuff happened on May 21st, 1984. Uh, Marshall Smith was the big boss at the time, if anyone remembers him. Uh, and this was from an engineering staff meeting. We were doing a product review. Top four projects at engineering at the time were the C128. It was due quarter, first quarter, 1985. The PC, it was due the fourth quarter, 1984. The Z8000 machine, that was due the second quarter, 1985. And the LCD machine, which was due sometime in the future. And we, at that point, we started looking at or talking about next generation machines. So we scheduled a futures meeting. <clears throat> I, don't, I, I don't have a complete, complete list of attendees, but we were looking at what we can do next after those four projects were completed. And at that meeting, we decided our main target, our focus, was to beat the Apple IIc. <laughs> that was our, at that point, we decided that was the biggest threat to Commodore. Um, and I guess I, at that point, uh, at that meeting, I got a really annoying question, which, what, how do we get, how do we, what, what can we develop to start, what do we need to start writing the software for a m new machine before the first prototype is built? or even designed. <laughs> because right now, that back then, they decided that software was the problem. That was why we were always so slow at bringing out new machines. You know, if we could only get the software done first, <laughs> then it would simplify yeah. everything. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like the negative time latch that would solve mm -hmm. all kinds yep. of circuit problems. Yep, yep. Okay, yep. We could fix the problems in hardware via software before the hardware even exists. There you go. You wouldn't well, even need the hardware. <laughs> the strange thing is, this is how it's done yeah. these days. <laughs> On June 8th, we had a senior engineering staff meeting. And uh, Martin Shabilsky, who is uh, Adam Chaniak's go-to guy at that point for technical stuff, uh, who I actually later worked with, he's a good guy, uh, he gave a competitive analysis of all the other computers around and all the rumored computers. And that was the first mention anyone in engineering had heard of the Omega computer, <laughs> Omega. with an O. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we, we heard about it, we thought it would, had some interesting features, so uh, I was given the task of researching it. Um, on June 12th, 1984, there was a general manager's meeting in Europe. Word came back, or panicked word came back, that the GMs demanded a new machine for Christmas 85. They weren't happy with the projects engineering was working on. They wanted a 16 or 32-bit CPU, an 8-bit bus, and 64K of RAM, and a graphics processor with BitBlit and raster ops. And because they were all disturbed by the the Sinclair QL, which was going to take the market by storm. We couldn't compete, we couldn't, none of our current machines would compete against that. And so they were very concerned. But we were already doing, okay, in the staff meeting, we were decided we were already doing four machines. We just didn't have the resource to, to do a fifth. So we needed something short term that we didn't really mind if it became an orphan product, you know, not part of the Commodore family. Never, not compatible with anything, never to be seen after this one Christmas. So we decided that the only way to do that was to buy the technology from an existing group and help them get it to uh, finish the product. 
Uh, if we, they picked the right CPU, we could at least stick with the CPU for future stuff, but uh, we didn't really care. On the 19th, you see how fast this is running? Uh, we got the uh, full specs of the Omega computer. <laughs> it had a 68,000, 7.5 megahertz, 128K of RAM, expandable to 512K, 64K of ROM, custom animation bitlet, display sync coprocessor, uh, 640 by 400 high, high resolution with 3,016 colors. No one could figure out how that <laughs> came about. <laughs> Eight reusable sprites, 80 column color text with 40 columns on a standard TV, custom sound peripheral chip with four voices, nine octaves, complex waveforms, AM and FM, disk drive support, uh, and it would run PC-DOS, MS-DOS, or CPM-86. And it was going to cost $300 once it hit mass market. Its target was the Apple IIc again. We, how, are, how are they going to run uh, MS-DOS on the 68,000? Not Did sure. Tell you? Okay. Uh, this, yeah. was, this, was, this was the word from Amiga ah, that okay. got back to us. Oh, okay, so this is like marketing. Uh, marketing, yes. Yeah. Well, this was, uh, you know, pre, we hadn't actually made a deal. We were just, uh, sure, sure. just finding out. So uh, let's see, when we briefed Marshall on this, I was in this meeting. He wanted to be first with a 32-bit machine. Uh, we said, well, 32-bit system's not possible because of lead times. It requires a new software base. So he said, well, what if you got rid of the custom display processor? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, obviously. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> okay, next uh, we on the 21st was a meeting with Jay Miner. This was the first actual physical contact with uh, the Amiga folks. Now, now, Jay, though, is, is actually like an engineer and not a marketing person, right? Or was he somewhere in between? No, no, no he, Jay's a chip designer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So oh. we, were, we were at the point of, let's find out what this really is. So you might actually get some straight answers. Wow. Right, exactly, okay. exactly. Uh, we went into the meeting calling it the Omega and came out calling it the Amiga. Jay corrected us. <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> um, they were, t they t were working on a, a home computer, uh, mouse-based. Uh, their company at that point was 20 people. They needed... Uh, well, no, they needed 20 people. They had about half that, uh, and they could, uh, they could find good uses for about 50. Uh, the big issue was going to be the software, which, you know, it always is. Funniest thing. <laughs> Funniest thing. <laughs> but it looked like a good direction, so uh, we started the process of, like, figuring out how we could buy the Amiga. And when we, when we got back to Westchester, uh, Everything seemed to be quiet, you know, moving along. The, the rumor mill hadn't started spreading the Amiga yet, but we were studying everything we got from Jay at that point. Uh, on the 5th of July, we had a project review meeting. Uh, C128 was uh, C64CR, Z8000, and the LCD machine. All of them were on track except for the LCD machine. <laughs> But there was a one, one minor thing at the end of the meeting. We were starting to recruit in Westchester and Santa Clara uh, advertisement in the small advert ad in the San Jose Mercury News looking for ex Atari people for some reason, specifically. Mm. <laughs> and we were started internally, a couple of us started reviewing the Amiga chips. Um, see, on the 17th, uh, we were reminded by the general managers who talked to Adam and Sig, that they demanded a 16-bit machine, but this time they wanted it in the middle of 1985. They moved it up from Christmas. <laughs> and be, again, the target was Sinclair QL. Uh, Amiga still looked like the best candidate. Side, this is on the 17th. Um, this is our first meeting with uh, Metacompo. Everybody remembers Metacompo, BCPL, AmigaDOS, so, all right. Okay, this was actually, we met with them on something entirely different. We were actually looking at trying to pitch us uh, an OS for the National 3216 oh, yeah. chip. <laughs> uh, you remember that period. 
period. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that was supposed to take over the world. Yes, it the was. National, they also they also and, had a and gra they also had graphics chips with the. They, they made like five of them. Uh, if not, yeah. yeah. There, there were too many thirty-two bit ish chips around then. So we we met with yeah. Derek Budge, uh, and he gave us the uh, the lowdown on Metacomco and so on. Uh, Tripos, uh, they had eighteen people. They had a Pascal compiler. They had BCPL. And they were using Lattice C to uh, port their tripos to the quanta, the Sinclair QL, and that really made it uh, a win. So we, we actually liked them, uh, so we actually uh, started a contract with them to do something, but not Amiga. It just this mm -hmm. these this is how we met them. <clears throat> we continued uh, on the 18th. Uh, we talked to Bob Pariso, and he gave us the lowdown on the software and the status. Mm -hmm. Um, we kept looking at uh, Amiga hardware, and at this point we brought the lawyer into it, Nick Lefever. Uh, Amiga patents, Amiga patent infringements, all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. That that got kind of messy. Um, and we talked to uh, <clears throat> with our chip guys uh, to investigate how to get the Amiga chips into MOS's process. You know, they were looking at things like the Spice model. All differences in processes, getting test tapes to MOS, the differences in design rules, um, metal pitch differences, all that stuff that, you know, necessary for MOS to actually consider making the Amiga chips. Had, so I imagine they breadboarded it at that point. Had they fabricated the chips for the first time? No. Okay. But there was a, there was a breadboard, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. a functional breadboard, which pieces of which still exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, we also got, the, at that point, finally, we got the full Amiga specs, um, and we were able to actually start costing out the machine. Elroy Schoenfeld uh, was able to start looking at how much it would cost us to actually build this thing, and I was, uh, started looking around for application software for the uh, machine, what, who was working for what, because they, Amiga had actually reached out to software developers, third-party software developers, and there were already people who you know, we're thinking about the Amiga, working on them. Come to think of it, there might, there were chips at this point. Hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there were yeah. chips. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah mid-84? Mid yeah, mid-84, yeah. there yeah. were definitely yeah, there chips, chips there. Chips. I know. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, they were at the, I guess they were at the Zorro backplane, yeah. Zorro motherboard by then? Yeah. In the black metal cases. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, that was, they were that was black. The, yeah, that was the one after the Lorraine. Right. Or, or was so it was yeah, a wooden keyboard yeah, was, and black metal yeah. case. Yep. Yeah, that, and, and some real <laughs> prototype chips with right. different names. Right, different, <laughs> different names. So uh, let's see, we continued to evaluate the Amiga chips. We started putting more people on it, like Madeline <laughs> Shaw. Um, and I was uh, given the task of designing, a, a, roughing out a C64 success chips. <laughs> so, um, let's see, what game should we port? Should we do a cartridge or a disc? You know, little questions like that. I was get you know, 32K ROM. Minor little, minor yeah. little decisions. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was going to go with 32K ROM, uh, graphics library, sprite library, sound library, maybe animation, who knows, uh, text routine, and disc. And uh, we, I was going to expect the developers to treat it like a 64, you know, hit those registers directly because that's what they want. <laughs> they want. At the uh, 25th, we've got our first full Amiga memory map, and I realized that that was stupid. They, they, we're not going to be able to hit the, memory, the registers directly. Um, on the 27th, we bought Metacomco a Sage computer because we wanted them to start thinking 68,000 at uh -huh. that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, 29th, um, we, uh, it was time for the uh, trip for the uh, trip out to Omega. Uh, Martin Shabilsky and Madeline Shaw were the guy, people who went out there to actually meet with the engineers for the, except for the first time really, because we, we were going ahead with this. Where were they physically? Uh, well, Martin and Madeline were in Westchester, uh, and the Amiga people were in Los Gatos. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 So let's see. They, 
we, we prep Martin with questions uh, for the trip, like how do they do color area fill? Are there enough cycles to change the sprite width? Um, why, the, why is the mouse lot, you know, little, little things. Like that. Oh, and the big one, this, I was, the horizontal beam counter resolution was only, register was only nine bits. So how did they go to 640? Yeah. Little, little things like that. And uh, the, uh, can the chipset be used with something other than a 68K? Because we still hadn't decided that we were going to go 68K. Okay, on the 30th, that was the meeting with the team, uh, had an interesting thing. We, we, went, we, we reviewed the software. Carl Sassenrath, uh, uh, he was the OS kernel guy. The, at that time, the, o, the exec was 6K, and his target was 4K in the final product. They had a really strange idea. They, the intermediate product, the thing they had now, was going to shrink for the final version. <laughs> Nowhere, never in the history of software has this happened. But that, okay. Well, it, it happens when someone holds a gun to your head. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So exactly. Just this, the bullet. this was the this was the the kernel of the operating system, the the task scheduler, that kind of thing. Yes, okay. uh, it did uh, the the ROM calls through its uh, library concept. Uh, handled every, all lists were doubly linked, um, timerless, message based operating system, uh, task switch within uh, 110 microseconds all reentrant code, and basically kept everything on lists, memory, interrupts, uh, exceptions, ports, everything. No type checking at all. So, you know, it was just basically performance. This is all uh, 68,000 assembly at the all, time, too. All 68,000 assembly. Yep. Uh, we looked at the graphics library with Dale Luck. Uh, that was 16K bytes, and Dale was not going to shrink it at all. That was his, I mean, 16K was where he wanted it to be. It was going to stay that way. It had display operations, raster operations, line draw, blit. Layers was not done then, uh, but it was basically viewports, copper lists, you know, all the features that you know from uh, the final Amiga. Dale had a very strong idea of what it should do, and, you know, it was doing it. RJ, uh, everybody remembers RJ? Okay, he was, at that point, he was Mr. Animation, not Intuition. Mm -hmm. So he did the animation library. It was 12K bytes, 99% uh, in Whitesmith C. That was the C of choice back then for the Amiga development. Uh, virtual sprites using the copper list, a maximum of 50. And if, this, if all the virtual sprites were used up, it would automatically use Bob's, the uh, blitter objects. Uh, Kodiak, uh, Bob Burns. He, was, he showed off the text library. It was uh, 8K at the time, including 3K of fonts. The final was going to shrink to 4K, in, with, uh, and then the fonts were separate. All assembler, no C. The fonts at that point were named Helva, Carla, Dale, Olga II, and Rosa. <laughs> so, all different. Sam Dicker, uh, a Williams guy, uh, he was uh, music. His uh, Whitesmith C music library was 5K of code, um, sound generation. And here's where I have the, uh, the ball demo, for example, took uh, 512K bytes total of sound. Uh, the instrument was 256K, or 256 bytes, with 16 bytes for the envelope. Uh, let's see. So basically, we came out away with uh, seeing that the Amiga operating system at that time was 120K bytes of ROM, uh, including 20K for the debugger. Uh, but they were going to shrink it to 42K for the final thing. <laughs> well, it, it's easy as long as you leave out two out of every three bits, right? <laughs> right, and that was going to include 6K that did, of device drivers for the disk drive, practice device and serial device, which weren't in the 128K. Just <laughs> so let's see. We had a bunch of questions. Uh, on the 31st, uh, Adam 
and Sig went to Santa Clara and uh, basically said, yep, we're, we're buying them, or, you know, and the negoti serious negotiations started. Uh, let's see, they, on the August 3rd, uh, you know, we were talking with them, uh, 40 third-party vendors, 60 software packages coming on release. They were already working on the more advanced chipset for next year. Um, and, you know, we were going through the things like the options, rights, sale of rights to other companies, operating expenses, stock options, and so on. Uh, let's see, and let's see, on the 8th, engineering staff meeting, 32-bit computer was committed for mid-1985. Mid the Amiga was now up to $400 to $500, but the cost would be lowered after the introduction. <laughs> and we started uh, working on or talking to companies about the hard disk, which was going to be uh, $150 to $180 OEM costs, and it would be available in 18 months. On the 9th, the negotiations continued, but the option had to be extended, but both sides were negotiating in good faith, uh, and we wanted to, and rumors were starting to appear. On the 15th, did the Amiga announcement. Uh, so, you know, there were rules. Only the spokesman talks about the Amiga. No one else can make any comment whatsoever. No one can any say anything about lead times. And they were saying it was a 32-bit computer with advanced graphics and multitasking for the home and low-end business machine market. Esther and Santa Clara would work well together. <laughs> and that was basically, basically it. Wow. So oh, before, was... before, I, I promise, I, I promise my, I work for a company called Regent, and Dave does too. And uh, I promised my boss that I would say this, uh, we're looking for hardware guys and software guys, especially software people who know Linux and device drivers. And if you really know, if you know uh, the Mac 802.11 stack, you know, Wi-Fi, we'd love to talk to you. I have some students. <laughs> <laughs> wow, amazing stuff. Um, so, I understand that uh, sort of parallel to all of this was um, uh, they first were trying to introduce it and, and uh, display it and so forth before they were actually part of, before it was part of Commodore, is that, uh, mm -hmm. is that true? They were, so, they were showing it around. They were yeah. showing it yeah. around, yeah. 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 Then so, developers yeah. had uh, yeah. actual machines. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I was doing software outreach, you know, developer support for the Plus Four, so like I'd visit Infocom mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. they'd have a computer in a sealed room that I was not allowed to go into, yep. but they were raving about and you know, it's like, mm -hmm. uh, I tried to get them interested yeah. in this 6502 thing with, you know, plus four <laughs> graphics and they were saying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not so much. Not yeah, much. It's, 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 we've got something much more exciting that we can't show you. Yes, of course, yes. Well, so I suspect that may have been the Boeing demo or some version of that that uh, uh, has quite a, quite a story uh, at CES 1984, uh, where it was you know, created at the last minute. But this was pretty remarkable for the time. Uh, a large ball bouncing on the screen. In uh, stereo. In stereo. In <laughs> yes. stereo. The bounces were stereo. That was the, the impressive thing. And, uh, and so... My understanding is this is what they were running on. This was the, the uh, uh, Lorraine was the, the Lorraine, prototype. Lorraine was, there were, there were a couple different prototypes. Lorraine was one of the prototype boards. The Zora was another one. Okay. Um, yeah, that was, you know, in the, basically in the early days. Um, the first one I saw inside of was actually at uh, CES 85, mm, okay. where um, I, uh, uh, Bill Hurd and I, in fact, went back to uh, the, the Amiga Suite and uh, got to take one apart because, of course, you want to see what's inside. We both cracked up laughing because they had a uh, they had a little tower board. Mm -hmm. If you if you if you ever de develop things, the tower is the board that you stick inside the chip socket because you because you need to add some stuff to that ah, chip. Okay. They had a tower sitting on under the I guess it was the Daphne chip at that point. And um, every one of our C128s at that point had a tower that was done over uh, over Christmas and New Year's under the 856380 column chip to phase lock it to the system because the the internal chip didn't bother to phase lock. Oh, okay. And um, so these, these are these are yeah. fabric. So, 
so, wires. Yeah, right? yes, okay. yes. Yeah, it's, okay. it's a little circuit board that was yeah you know, that's made at the last minute. So we just started cracking up, laughing. We looked inside, and uh, I'd met it with them later to discuss like parts that we actually use on our 128 and other systems. So when they went to the final motherboard for uh, mm -hmm. for the 1000, they were they were kind of building in parallel with what we had been doing. Mm -hmm. using some of the same parts because for some reason back then if you use the same parts it was actually an advantage rather than these days when you know oh well, we can only get so many of that part you better use a different part for that one yeah, yeah. <laughs> apparently yeah. it's traditional for the uh, board layout guy to put a chip upside down and that's what a lot of the towers corrected ah uh, yes uh-huh yeah, that, yeah. You know, they, they, oh, that they, they here not there oh right our, yeah. our very our very first 68,030 uh, prototype had the 68,030 on the other, uh, it was the, it was, oh, done, it was, it was done upside down. Yeah. Well, no, actually that's, that was the thing I learned from that. <laughs> it was supposed to be put on correctly. It was a mistake that was put on backwards and I'm like, oh, this is easier to probe. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah that's good. Yeah, yeah. So I guess they weren't all mistakes after that. <laughs> yeah, no, I had a friend who, who did that with a, a, yeah. a PGA chip and mm -hmm. manually yeah. rewired it was pretty yeah the 68,030s at that point were PGMs yeah, mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah, yeah not that that was before they had the uh, PLCCs like the yeah so it made it in yeah. 1985 it actually came out the, the Amiga 1000 let's let's see what the score is so uh, let's see you you said they were originally targeting 128k they went up to 2056k no no they were it was 128k for the uh, what they had then but they were going to reduce it to, uh, <laughs> ah, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was. Oh, uh, you're talking about the, the RAM. RAM. Sorry, yeah. RAM, yeah. 120K RAM, 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 they were planning 120K expandable. Oh, this, so this was actually uh, 256K expandable. Yeah, okay. Yeah. There was a little, little, yeah. Door, yeah. little door in the front that let you put oh, in the other nice. 256K. Yeah. yeah. But pretty breathtaking stuff, actually, for 1985. 496 colors on the screen. Yep, 12-bit 12, yep. 12 color. They did, yeah. they did uh, overcome that 3,016. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they must have fixed it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and 640 by 400. 400 is an amazing number because you can't do that on a single NTSC frame. You've got to do interlaced. Yeah. Um, yep. And so that was that was a huge thing. Um, it would do uh, six bit planes, most eight sprites per scan line. Uh, you know the uh, the eight bit audio channels that would go up to 24 kilohertz. That's pretty. That's pretty heady stuff for that. That speed and you know an actual hardware blitter. There were not too many things that could move graphics around like that at that point. In right. fact, we uh, I think some of the some of the uh, third parties were doing uh, benchmarking on and to do their own blitter routines, trying to be faster than the blitter over the years. Mm -hmm. And you had to get to a pretty good sixty eight thousand twenty yeah. before you could go faster than the blitter. And that's because the sixty eight thousand twenty has a hardware barrel shifter. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And Jay actually, Jay Minor actually objected when everyone anyone called it a blitter, because uh, it could do math operations yeah. as it uh, as it blitted. It was more than just a copy engine. Yeah. So he wanted to call it a, a blimmer, I think. A blimmer, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah but that yeah. never it caught could, on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it yeah. could do mathematics, because it could do, it was three operands, and almost everybody else's blimmer was just two operands at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I have a, uh, uh, where did it go? I went around somewhere. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so this was the, uh, it actually ended up being called Blitter, at least in the Amiga Pro. Oh, yeah, it, so yeah. Jay, it was Jay, just, that was kind of the name that had already been agreed yeah, upon yeah. in the industry. Jay, Jay yeah. was the only person who would wanted to, you know, uh, okay. to be the blimmer. Uh, okay, right, right. And I wanted to call Bob's Blobs, but <laughs> that didn't catch on either. <laughs> That's really a shame. I know, Blitter yeah. Objects, right? Yeah, 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 objects. yeah, yeah Bob's. it makes, makes good Bob's. sense, yeah. Oh right, so it, it it takes it it would do arbitrary uh, three operand uh, any uh, any boolean operation any boolean function of, of three bits. Yeah, it's pretty neat stuff. You could actually do life with it. That's fun. I'm sure somebody did that at one point. Oh yeah. 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 Yep. Just running with the blitter. And of course, the uh, in fact, the uh, the uh, floppy was encoded and decoded with a blitter. Oh, <laughs> makes good sense. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. This was basically unheard of in 1985 to have um, uh, custom chips responsible for so much, able to do so much at the time. 
right? So this was the, the, the earlier Lorraine prototype. And, uh, well, let's see. We have Agnes, uh, Daphne, and Portia, uh, I guess half of whom disappeared. Well, uh, Denise, uh, Daphne became Denise, and, and Portia, Portia became, became Paula. Paula. Okay, yeah, yeah. So some, you know, some, some people got dumped, so they had to change the names of the chips. <laughs> yeah, basically. But yeah, an amazing okay. thing. So, uh, so here's Agnes with the... Um, um, oh, uh, this one here, he managed to get the bimmer in. <laughs> oh, there, oh, there you go. Yeah. 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 Well, and this also had this 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 unusual uh, copper coprocessor. Yeah. So what's the what's the story on that? I have some guesses about where that may have come from. Um, well, the, the the copper is basically a uh, it was a video synced coprocessor, and it could put out uh, it could put that put out um, register address uh, information and and load or save registers. So the interesting thing about the uh, the um, Amiga bus is that there's a, there's you can see it in there. There's the register address. Um, register address is, is can add, can access registers, but it also sort of sends commands to chips. Hmm. Um, in that it that controls all the all the DMA every DMA channel that's run out there is a is you know every uh, uh, DMA resources things that things that happen via DMA channels are all assigned to register addresses, and so like video fetch. Well, each mm -hmm. each bit plane had its own RGA address. Um, you know, floppy sound, all of that had RGA addresses. So, the copper basically puts you, you, it has things like wait for you know wait for a beam position, do some do some copper stuff. So it could go and reload all your color registers, or it could move sprites around, or it could do all that. Anything. It could load yeah. the uh, different. Yeah. It could change the sprite pointers on the on the sixty four. You know, changing the sprite pointers mm -hmm. was actually problematic for software mm -hmm. because. We get locked out on some some scan lines. Uh, you could never predict that. But with the copper list, you know, we know we could get that through. Mm -hmm. So, like uh, like doing split screen on the 64, that was a tricky because, like logo, for example, wanted a split screen. But there were certain places I couldn't split the screen because <laughs> the 64 was the processor was locked out at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I, we get this flickering. Yeah, yeah. Ours uh, was here earlier talking about that. So you could have, you've, you know, annoyed him. But the, you know, oh, why did you steal this bus during these cycles? But yeah, but this was this was quite a bit different in that it was sort of designed up front to be able to do stuff synchronously with the with the beam. Yeah, mm -hmm. how that was that was doing. So I think the uh, Atari 400 and 800 uh, had something almost like this, but not quite as quite as fancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, t well, so Jay Miner had designed those chips as well, if yeah. I remember. Yeah. Okay. And that they had their player missile graphics, which were, you know, a bit different. Yeah. yeah, yeah but uh -huh. the you know the, a similar idea to a sprite. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it makes good sense. So uh, let's see. Oh, and another thing that I sort of couldn't believe when I was going through was um, 25 channels of DMA Yeah, going on? well, the thing is that it's, you know, you put out, basically when you put out a register bus address, um, every chip knows what that means, including it can be, there can be a DRAM read, a DRAM write, um, certain chips get involved, other chips ignore it. So that made DMAs very simple because you're basically, uh, Agnes is controlling everything. It puts out an address, it puts an address on the RGA bus and everything responds the way it's supposed to. Hmm. It's all it's all baked in. You can't change it. Hmm. Well, I mean, a few of them are flexible, but you know, like for instance, it, you know, you the 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 thing we used to let the CPU in there uh, went away when uh, when we were grabbing too much stuff because, of course, the chips had a priority to their own bus. Um, but yeah, it was. I mean, it was a real elegant system. It, it was maintained um, w going well into the future. Uh, mm -hmm. There's stuff that we were working on near the end that never made it out the door that was still, even though it was completely revamped chips, we're still doing things kind of the same way. Hmm. Okay. Well, so that's, that's an interesting question. So yeah. there were many, many models of the, the Amiga that came out, I mean, compared to like well, the Commodore 64 or something right. like that. Mm -hmm. that right, right. Yeah. Um, um, so, how much of a hassle was backwards compatibility? It seemed like there were a lot. There were a lot of registers, and a lot of things did sort of go in and attack them fairly directly. Well, we had, we had the advantage or disadvantage of not having a whole lot of changes for a bunch of years to start with because of uh, 
well, uh, decisions that were made at management level that we had no control over. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I, I think there were some software weirdnesses that you had to deal with. Um, there were some, there were some tricks with, uh, I know they had, they had to deal, they had to also work around uh, application software, like games kind of grabbing resources, but not completely shutting the operating system down. So, um, so yeah, hmm. the, having an, a real operating system was actually a big advantage. Um, yeah. People weren't actually poking the chips directly. They were using the graphics library. They were, you know, using, well, wow. They were using raw input uh, to get, you know, input. So they they weren't using all of it, but hmm. uh, they weren't. Most things weren't poking the chips directly. Oh, so wow. that that. However, yeah. we every uh, OS version upgrade, we had to go through a extensive compatibility testing phase, mm -hmm. and some pe some. Companies like Electronic Arts uh, were really annoying, uh, be mostly because of memory usage. Uh, they would figure out how much stack a particular routine was taking and make sure that you know, that was exactly how much stack they allocated. So, uh, you know, and if we like, it, it, added a, yeah. <laughs> put an extra register on the stack at that point, you know, for that routine, Oh, their, oh their program they stopped working. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and um, I mean, we, we, we did a, uh, we, we weren't completely um, obsessed when we went on to extending the chipsets for compatibility because of that, because nobody was poking registers. <laughs> um, it was actually okay if a few programs failed. Yeah. Um, it wasn't okay if... <laughs> <laughs> we, were, um, we were shooting yeah. for 90%. Yeah. Unlike okay. the 128 where they demanded yeah. 100%, yeah. we were willing to give up 90%, uh, give yeah. up so, 10%. Yeah, so when we went to, when we went to the Pandora chips, um, we, the copper lists weren't directly compatible, I think, in, 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 in every mode at least. Um, there were, mm -hmm. I mean, there were, a lot more cop, there were a lot more registers available because you had all 256 uh, um, color registers in the LUT available oh, okay. through the, mm -hmm. through the oh, copper okay. list, which mm -hmm. had not been there before. Mm -hmm. um, there was, uh, um, when we went to, uh, even before that, we went to uh, a MiG 3000. I, I, for hardware, we had we had compatibility issues as well. We had to look into. Um, part of that was internal, in that the bridge card had to work, or I got hit over the head <laughs> with a stick. So um, there were a few things about the uh, about the bus that had been designed um, as an expansion bus that hadn't really been formalized. That then became formalized mm -hmm. because um, of the behavior of certain things. Um, I, we ran into some third-party boards that were fairly like there was this thing called Amiga Live that was mm -hmm. a you know live video digitizer um, mm -hmm. that didn't work in the 3000 on the 32-bit bus when he first got it. It was a 16-bit car, supposed to run in compatibility mode. They were breaking some rules. Um, I actually got them because it's kind of nice when you're a Commodore, you can say send me your PAL equations and I'll tell you what you did wrong. <laughs> I also told them how to fix it without changing with, with just by changing the PAL. They didn't oh, have nice. to run any new wires because mm -hmm. they were just not qualifying something with address strobe or whatever, and it was. It it was it saw some noise on the bus that didn't that was for 32-bit people only that it was responding to. Um, so, but you know the thing is, I mean, we also had problems with yeah uh, you know, with application with applications that were not 32-bit clean. When once we started wanting to add 32-bit memory, um, some of the some of the uh, some of the support people had written uh, tools that let you find that out ahead of time. If you used, if you could test on a machine with an MMU, oh. you could use the MMU to find your bugs. Um, one was one was called Enforcer, and um, and it was, you know, it was kind of a developer tool. But before you knew it, um, all of the magazines knew about Enforcer, had their own copy, and would write bad reviews if you got Enforcer hits. Yeah. Ah. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> And we had Memmung. Yeah, you know, Memmung. Uh, okay. Because uh, all memory was allocated through exec, you couldn't just grab memory. We could actually do stuff on the allocation and free to check for whether or not you've wow. violated the limits. Actual, actual operating system discipline in the mid Well, it was the, the idea was to discipline it on a machine that could discipline it that would then allow you to have those those bug fixes on every machine, because the older machines obviously couldn't. Sure, sure. And, and the operating system really never been written to support, at the time, to support MMUs. Okay. Um, but, well, yeah. so you didn't yeah. have an MMU in the 68,000. <clears throat> right, 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 right. Yeah. When did, when did you the first, first The first MMU was in the, uh, the, the, the A2620 add-on card for the 2000. Mm. So when when I when I took over the 2000, there was there had been a uh, there, the the, two, the original 2000 was based on 
the 1,000 plus, there's a schematic diagram in a book called Schematics and Expansion Specifications that was made back when it was the other board. Mm. So that's where the Zorro bus got its name. Is because there was a there was a there was an add-on card that just had you know Zorro on there, which meant it was for the Zorro motherboard. But you know they because they hadn't changed the they wouldn't know if they were going to change the expansion bus. In fact, that that I think back then it was an expansion chimney. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the cards were enormous. Yeah, uh, and it was going to go in. The, I think the uh, next generation machine was called the Ranger. Yeah. Right. Well, that was their next gen. Yeah, their 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 idea of the next generation was going to do. They were going to have some twix, tweaks for a high res bitmap mode. But and it was also yeah. going to have a cage it, it, yeah. built in with those yep. enormous cards. Yeah. Yeah. So so anyway, the uh, so so um, where was where was like where was I going with this? <laughs> um, what? MMUs. M oh, so yeah. So so um, it turns out that the 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 two guys who started the uh, the. Amiga 500, who came up with Fat Agnes, was Bob Welland and George Robbins, and they had been the guys doing the, what Andy mentioned before, the Z8000 machine, which was, mm -hmm. Z8000 machine was, think of basically a, a kind of like a Sun 2. Mm -hmm. it, they were gonna have a, a megapixel bitmap display with GUI. Um, they, running coherent. Running coherent. Mark Williams coherent. Which was, you know, Unix clone. Mm -hmm. And um, it ran a, uh, one of the guys, Rico Tudor, had written his own super fast windowing system, which was basically just to, it wasn't like you think of in a, on, a, on an Amiga or a Macintosh or something, it was really just to have multiple terminals, but it was a windowing system and it was, it was wicked fast. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so they, they still wanted a machine that would run Unix mm -hmm. of some sort. So um, um, Bob Wellen's dastardly plan was, to build a 68,020 add-on card, and in the 2000, when I was building the 2000, it's like, well, I, yeah, I have this extra slot here that I don't need anymore because I could fit a megabyte on the main board, and that had been that was really just the edge of the 1,000 that mm -hmm. connector, mm -hmm. pretty much. So I decided that well, it, it ought to have some additional protocols in there since I was integrating the bus controller, all the PALs and stuff into a single bus controller called Buster, I said, well, I'm gonna have a, a new protocol that lets you just plug in a chip and that chip can request to be master of the whole system and you don't have to take your 68,000 out or anything. And so we had you know, a built-in idea, built-in plan for an expansion card that gave you a new, better CPU. Because of course, you know, we were using the same CPU in 1986, 1987 that, you know, that Amiga had used in 1985. So, so, we, um, so the first one had the, uh, had the, uh, had the Motorola um, 68851 MMU on it as well as the 881 math chip mm -hmm. and two, two megabytes of real 32-bit memory on it. And that was uh, that became the uh, Amiga 2000 slash 20. Yeah, this is awful. It, this is yeah. nothing. Something else I need to add to my collection. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, Amiga 2000 yeah. slash 20 was uh -huh. was uh -huh. it, now that was that was running 14.3 megahertz uh, clock, which mm -hmm. came from the the quadrature clocks that we had. We had seven and a we had a signal called uh, CDAC, which was seven megahertz delayed by 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. So I could make a 14 megahertz clock with an XOR gate. <laughs> and, uh, and actually we kind of, that kind of got past the FCC guys because they always look, they, they pay a lot more attention if there's an oscillator on the board. Ah. Um, but that was the first generation. Then um, I, I, we made a second one with the 68,030. <laughs> one, one day, uh, one of the managers, Gerard Bucas, uh, or maybe it was Jeff Porter, one of them came to me and said, oh, we're getting a 68,000, the prototype 68,030 chip in next week. That's all they said. A week later, I had a card to plug it in, which wow. I designed, redesigned from scratch, basically spent the entire week without sleep, because I didn't want it to just work on a, uh, uh, I didn't want to run a 14.3 anymore. I wanted to run at 25 megahertz, possibly 33. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had to figure out how to do it asynchronously so it would be, so you could go out to the 68,000 bus at normal speeds, but run faster. Um, because we the 030 had a built-in MMU, uh, we didn't have to have space. There was enough room down there for four megabytes of uh, of, of of DRAM, and uh, this was the one that had the processor on the wrong side of the board because um, Fisher Terry Fisher is layout guy who was doing all, basically all my boards back then um, hadn't quite noticed the bottom view <laughs> because again this was going to this was something that we were going to do in about a week because uh, yeah. I knew this chip was coming. Yeah. <laughs>
And um, yeah, that was speedometer was like that. Like you know, I I could just build this thing, tell uh, you know, tell Porter or Bukas that like, oh, I have this thing uh, I just did. Oh, we'd like to. Can we can we make it? <laughs> can we get it? Can we on it? Did you did a sixty-eight or thirty board ever make it to market? Yeah, yeah that yeah. became the that became the uh, the Amiga three thousand slash thirty. And okay. uh, that's the one first one we got uh, Amiga Unix running on. When that had a, that actually. Had Enough, enough memory to really run Amiga Unix. I actually ran Amiga Unix, well, it was called Amix. It wasn't Amiga Unix. It, the first one was Amix, because that was before you were allowed to use Unix in your Unix name. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And Amix ran in two megabytes, <laughs> but like if you loaded GNU Emacs, it would thrash. Mm -hmm. you, you would cost nothing but hard disk activity. So it really, it really wasn't practical to, you could, virtual memory, but it wasn't practical. Mm -hmm. four, four megabytes four meg was actually yeah. enough to run it pretty well. You could actually run a UI <laughs> and run, uh, yeah. I think it was Gosling's Emacs at the time. Uh, it, no, it was, it was definitely, I, I I'm not Gosling's, sure. Yeah. I, used, oh, I used Gosling's Emacs too, ever since Carnegie Mellon, but that's because <laughs> it's that's where he wrote it. But, right. but um, yeah, I, I, maybe it was Gosling's Emacs. It was Emacs anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. it was big. <laughs> kind of the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, I had a few more uh, technical things. So, yeah. uh, one thing that's interesting about it, so Amiga has this just amazing graphics system compared to anything else at the time. One of the things that was somewhat unusual is it used uh, bit planes where uh, you always had one bit per pixel, but if you yeah. wanted multiple colors, you, you would stack them effectively. And that's quite a bit different from uh, virtually every other where you would do two bits in a row or four bits in a row or something like yeah. that. What was, the, what was the thought behind that? Do you know how that came about? Um. And it, no, that was, you, uh, that you know, I, was made. Uh, that was long yeah, before. I, okay. my my take on it was it was just made the hardware easier because you had you know you had a I, you had a DMA channel for each plane, mm, okay. and they you know they you, there wasn't any need to coordinate you know mm -hmm. okay I, I I wasn't changing you know I wasn't changing DMA structure or anything to fetch it differently. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, oh, you know, so they line up, and that was, and I had actually, I had actually um, been reading about a National Semiconductor. We mentioned the uh, yeah, yeah. the thirty ten uh, sixteen chip or whatever before. Well, they also had a, a uh, they had a, um, a graphics uh, processor, which uh, you had a main processor and you had individual satellite processors. Each one managed a bit plane, ah, and okay. you could stack as many of those as you wanted to make as deep a display oh. as you wanted, okay. and of course. You could make, you know, you, you didn't take any more, you had to have separate memory for each one, but it didn't, you know, sure, sure. You, you, you had a lot of redundancy there where you could just, you know, you wanted a 32-bit display, 24-bit display, you put 24 of those in there. Of course, you know, it was nothing we could ever afford to use, but it was cool to read about. Sure, you know, sure. I'd, yeah. I'd been reading about all that stuff because, you know, like, where, where are we going in the future? Hmm. Um, but, yeah, so I, I, that was my take on it was that it was just, it was kind of an e economy of design. Um, when we got to... When we got to the the never released uh, advanced Amiga architecture, we had bit planes, we had chunky pixels, we had a thing mm. called hybrid pixels, which mm. look a little bit like uh, like MPEG uh, DCT cells, in that there's they sort of compress <coughs> color in weird ways. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. So it was usable for animation yeah, well, back uh, in the day before you actually had real animation process. Or, we, or, or, on yeah. the Amiga, it was a real pain to port Doom. Because of the bit plane architecture. Oh, oh sure. So yeah. uh, the AGA, the advanced, would have made it a lot easier. Ah, uh, okay. No, that makes that makes sense Every, because everybody else was using chunky pixels. Yeah, everybody so. else was yeah. using chunky. But you pixels. could, yeah, you could also, you could have, uh, you could have ten bit planar, eight bit chunky. Okay. Um, can't think of any other okay. particular numbers, yeah, but it was, uh, yeah, it was that was that was not something that we'd completely forgotten about. It was just, yeah, you know, it was a matter of you know the the age. So when we went to when we went to uh, the the Pandora or AA, it, it was called AA because we started a, a AAA Advanced Amiga Architecture in 1988. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. We started AA in like 1990. Mm, okay. But but it was sort of like people thought of it as AA Junior, but it was, it was as as AAA Junior, but it really wasn't. It was really it was really you know the the a, a new version of the existing chipset oh, okay. with with new parts that uh, well so the Alice chip was basically Agnes with some other stuff in it. Hmm. 
Um, you needed to make some more register paths and, and others, but it was, that, that ship was the, I think, the largest NMOS ship Commodore ever made, and they were very worried about breaking things um, because it was so large. Uh, Lisa was brand new chipped on in CMOS. Mm -hmm. um, Commodore actually had a CMOS process there. We had a one and a half micron CMOS process. It wasn't really what you wanted for Lisa, so we were also making them at HP in their one micron process. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this was really before contract chip fabbing was sure. was much of a thing. I mean, you could get it done, but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a big wasn't business for anybody. So, so you kind of had to ask nicely and and not make mistakes like like forgetting to order the parts six months or a year in advance or whenever you needed them, um, which of course Commodore did trying to roll these machines out. But we had I had the. I had the uh, the first double A machine up and running in January of '91, mm. but there was a chip problem. We couldn't get a display. So, so early in February, we got a new chip in. I forget which. I, I even though Lisa was a display chip, I think it might have been an Alice problem. Mm. But anyway, we got new Alice. We got the new chip in. It booted Kickstart. Um, it had some issues because, of course, couldn't use any of the new registers. But, um, but it worked. It ran, you know, and, and it was uh, it was a uh, year and a half before they got it out the door because of management flip flops Challenges, and stuff. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Sure. yeah. But it was uh, but but because of the because of the limitations on particularly on the Alice design, they couldn't they you know they couldn't go and add chunky pixels at that point. They couldn't add a bunch of other stuff. Um, just because it was it was beyond the scope. Now we pushed really hard to get a CMOS version of the of the address processing chip, mm -hmm. the, you know, and a, a CMOS Alice done. There was talk of doing a double A plus, mm -hmm. um, and that was mostly driven by George Robbins, who because triple A was never going to be something you could put in an A five hundred type machine. It was just to be mm -hmm. too expensive. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So they were at least, you know, unless we had gone to another level of integration, because you know, four or six custom chips that are bigger than any of the custom chips today, you know, or, you know, back, you know, right. of, yeah. uh, Amiga, Amiga chips mm -hmm. um, was going to be an issue. Yeah, that makes, makes good sense. Oh, I wanted to uh, uh, show this, uh, this pretty picture. So I think we're actually looking at what you could see on, an, on uh, one of the early Amigas. And so this is using the Holden model. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tam mode, yeah. Yeah. So what... What was, uh, were you involved in, in that, or was that another thing that sort of... I mean, I've heard stories it. about it. Yeah, um, that, yeah. That, that came with the original chips. Yeah, it was, uh, okay. it was, it was originally part of the chips. And uh, I think it was an accident. <laughs> I, 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 I mean... Well, I had heard, I had heard that, the, that they were originally talking about um, uh, doing YUV color instead of RGB color. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. So hold and modify makes a whole lot more sense if you've got a Y, if, you're, if, you're, if your internal color processing is YUV right. instead, of, yes. right. instead right. of RGB. Mm -hmm. um, which, of course, if you're building a game machine, you know, but they weren't really building a game machine, but they had, you know, early on it was good. You yeah. know, they were, yeah. they were selling it as a game machine. Right. They wanted to build a personal I think computer. think it ultimately but, succeeded as a game yes. machine, but yeah. Well, uh -huh. yeah, it, it, yeah it, was, it was very popular for, well, it was, mm -hmm. it was computer gaming. It's not the it same was Computer, yeah, it was okay. computer gaming. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, actually, the, uh, the the one that really was a game machine, the CD32, was uh, was that one of those victims of not having enough parts. <laughs> oh, funny! I'd be doing dealing with that um, all of these years later, which uh, it's been a bit bad year for parts the, in the last two years as well. Quite, quite. <laughs> for completely other reasons. <laughs> yeah, I was struck by the. Interesting mix of things, almost all devoted toward graphics, but then of course there was the whole audio yeah. uh, system, which was amazing at the time as well. Um, let's see. So, one of the things that was amazing is it, it had the ability to do, uh, you know, like called it dual play fields, right? Mm -hmm. It was never mm -hmm. referred to as a frame buffer, it was always a play field or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, we, yeah. We, we really only use that for the sliding screens in the operating system. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, where you could slide, I mean, <laughs> oh, the, right. okay. the yeah. earlier, the pre-intuition user interface actually made use of that to uh, do more than one thing at a time. Oh, but okay. uh, once intuition kicked in and started using layers, hmm. uh, that really got ignored. You kind of have to, you'd have to be programming the system pretty close to the metal to be able to use that, I guess, because the operating system didn't like it? Uh, the operating yeah. system used it okay. fine, okay. but it oh. was... Uh, it didn't like 
it, it, the user interface yeah. just didn't do much with it right. except okay. to have yeah. you know multiple multiple sliding screens. Ah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. makes sense. And mm -hmm. it it has also a curious mixture. I'm trying to think of other systems that would have this, where it both has. Uh, the the blit facility, which is the the block yeah. transfer, so you'd be able to mm -hmm. copy one thing to another, um, and true hardware sprites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, again, I'm curious if you if you know the genesis of this or what the effect of all of that of, of having both facilities available it seems quite well, unusual. I think I mentioned uh, that earlier. Uh, there's a limit to the number of virtual sprites that you can get by uh, playing copperless games to change the pointer. Uh, yeah. And uh, But games wanted more moving objects than that. And this blitter was just sitting there. So uh, okay. uh, RJ in his first animation library uh, would do both. You know, he'd, uh -huh. he'd do a sprite, okay. virtual sprites until he ran out, and then he'd switch to uh, blobs, or bobs rather. Bobs. Oh Blitter wow, objects. okay. And it was seamless that you could actually program with it and sort of you know, yeah. not know that it yeah. was, right. wow. Okay. Okay. It would be hidden from the, uh, you know, the programmer. <laughs> Another reason wow. for using the operating yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. No, that yeah. Is, that is but that, that animation mm. library didn't really uh, survive. Mm. Uh, instead, uh, RJ would switch to Intuition mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. uh, and Graphicraft and Textcraft. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Well, yeah, I'm that actually... That makes sense. No, okay. No, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> okay. That would have been great to have that. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm impressed, actually. The fact that you were able to maintain operating system interfaces to things as opposed to people going in and, and getting at the registers directly, somehow that meant that you had enough performance, right? Most of the time, the, the you know, going in and playing with things directly or whatever it was because it was too slow or, or ineffective or mm -hmm. something like that, but somehow it seemed to work. Yeah. Which is pretty, pretty. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing when you have when you have the blitter that can move things around a whole lot faster than the CPU, and it's not that intuitive to set it up yourself. You're, you know, calling the library that sets it up. Uh, not a big much deal. Much more right? natural. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's not like you're gonna. You know, it's not like you're trying to write your customized display code just a little bit faster than the, you know, than the guy who did did it in your graphics uh, okay. library. You're, you know, you're calling uh, on a hardware resource that, that's a little tricky to use otherwise. Same thing with sprites you know it's not you know i mean you know you people could set up their own sprites and write their own copper lists and stuff well, that makes good sense okay yeah. so not only so actually there's two things there's one is make sure the performance is high high enough but then also raise the complexity to the point where people want to use the software interface that's that's brilliant actually i like that i think that's the modern solution as well Oh, and don't well, tell anybody about what the hardware's actually doing. That's the other one. Well, yeah, that's that, uh, that's a key point. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and part of that part of that is because you know, like in some cases, you uh, you get the chip that you built, not the chip that you specified. So uh, if you didn't write the spec in the first place, you've got nothing to apologize for. Ah, um, okay. And yeah. we actually we had a few of those, even in hardware. So, for instance, um, there's a bug in the lease in the in the uh, rather the Alice chip on on the on the Pandora Double H chip systems, where um, if you if you implement it the way it's supposed to be implemented, the cup the blitter can actually turn on at weird times when the, ah. when there's display or mm -hmm. and um, or, or something. There's some there was a collision, and um, I found it. And worked around it in system logic, and then told the chip oh. guys about it, and they're like, "So you fixed it?" I'm like, "Yeah, like, so <laughs> we're not gonna, because <laughs> so you, you there was no other reason to rev the chip at that point." <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah. No, you you, you flipped the the, the bug to feature. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, it was it wasn't it, there was nothing to do with nothing useful about it. It was just that I had I had a I had a, uh, hmm. I had a uh, pal that had to sit there and snoop the chip bus anyway. Hmm. So. Okay, while you're doing that, you you know, and you fix, you know, because I, you know, I had, I mean, basically, because the 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 ability to let the CPU talk on the chip bus was kind of left up to the system designer. Sure, sure. Um, okay. So while I was doing that, I could do a few. I, I could basically throw them a bone and make sure that the, you know, that the. Uh, I think I ended up latching the blitter busy signal or something like that mm -hmm. through through a double cycle, and that solved the problem. Very impressive. And of course, all these people, it's funny, all these people like, who are now cre recreating Amigas get to see these, mm -hmm. <laughs> these little dirty secrets we never told sure, anybody. Sure. But. Yeah. <laughs> well, but at the same time, that probably makes their life a little bit easier if all they have to do is make the operating system work. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think they're re I don't think they're recoding huge vasts of the op huge, yeah, huge bits yeah. of, unless unless they're re unless they're writing their own retargetable graphics library or something. Big challenge. Yeah. Is that especially since that was quite that work was never quite finished. Nope, no, 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 not quite. <laughs> Would have been a little easier. Interesting. Uh, let's see. So we're doing okay on time, okay. but um, I was thinking at this point, if, there, if we have questions from the audience, maybe this would be the best, uh, this would be a time to switch over for it. And do we have a, an extra microphone? Yeah. I can speak without it. Is that uh, it's more for the recording, I think. Oh. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, this is a specification question, and I know this probably is more focused for Andy. By the time System Software 2 was coming out, which is also coincident with the, with the 3000, yeah. you know, very powerful, made the cover of Byte magazine, everyone knows that. Was there ever a time, was there any consideration for a network file system extension? I ask because I know that the, the 2065 card was available for the Unix style uh, 2500s and above, but yet it never made it into the 3,000 or the like, and is that something that even made it into the discussions for the specification and there just weren't resources to assign to it? That was my assumption. Yeah. It, seemed, it would have been necessary, well, would have been much helpful to the system at that time. It, it want, uh, we did want to support uh, an, an NFS uh, library, um, but uh, that just never happened. Resources, time, and uh, Lack of, uh, lack of management interest, I think, is the thing. I had a guy uh, who was actually uh, working on that, uh, but never, uh, never made it into a product. Sorry. <laughs> no, I understand. There are limitations. Uh, your timeline had covered like May 84 to September uh, in the purchase of Amiga. Uh, I'm right here. And uh, so uh, uh, Tremiel had acquired Atari in the July of that year. Did you guys have any so, uh, knowledge of the relationship or what was going on with Tremiel and Atari? And no, no. And he, uh, he acquired, well, yeah, the Amiga. It, it was really weird. Uh, I'm looking over the timeline, and uh, Amiga canceled the contract with uh, Tremel and returned the money on August 13th, which was, uh, and Commodore announced the acquisition of Amiga the next day. So uh, I don't understand how that quite worked so well, but that's, what, <laughs> that's, ex that's how it went down. Um, so clearly that was the uh, getting out of the contract was, uh, you know, had to happen, start happening after May and uh, before August 13th. No other questions? Okay, So, I know you said that there were a bunch of systems in development but was there any immediate effect on those projects when, when Commodore decides to buy Amiga? The projects you had going on, what was the immediate effect on Commodore? Well, they were starved for money at that point. It was taking up uh, a fair amount of Commodore's money. Uh, so like the LCD uh, project, which would have been a great machine, uh, couldn't get its 5K to do a soft tool case. and. Uh, <laughs> that was uh, kind of the end of the LCD project. Yeah, and and uh, the, the whole Z8000 project was shut down. The, the Commodore 900 is what they were calling it at the time. That was the, yeah, that was, that was going to be your, uh, your low-cost Sun 2 workstation. I'm not sure what they were, I'm not sure. It was very cool. All of us nerds liked it. I don't know what they were going to do with it in terms of putting it on the market because as, as, as alien as the Amiga was to Commodore's normal salespeople, this would have been even more so. Well, it's too bad, too, because Z8000 processor-based computers just went and took over the world at that <laughs> That's point. True. They had so few transistors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was very nice, yeah. Well, you know, they went to the Z80,000, and, you know, who knows? It could be a Z8 million at this point? Yeah. Okay. It, could, it could be, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, thank you. This is another system specification type, type question. At the time that the, <clears throat> that the 2000 was coming out, or being developed, and the hard drive interface or controller being made available, it does, uh, this is more, I guess, a question for uh, Dave. Yeah. What happened such that auto boot didn't come out when the 2000 came out and had to be, the card had to be re-offered another year later? That seems, well, it seems sort of obvious from the outside, and I remember that my uh, PC-centric uh, colleagues at the time couldn't understand how a, you know, a large boxed computer system would, would still need a floppy to start. Um, I guess there, there are some software issues <laughs> with the, uh, the auto-boot um, in 1.2, I guess it was fixed in 1.3. Um, that's my recollection. I don't remember exactly what the issues were. Um, it was, uh, there, there, was a, there was a whole system for this, uh, for discovering, uh, um, for, for discovering uh, ROM tags uh, in, in uh, expansion devices that, that told you, uh, that told the device, uh, you know, various things and eventually it worked fine. But, uh, you know, that's, that's my understanding of it is that a lot of the stuff was kind of happening all at once. So, you know, I was working on the Amiga 2000, Jeff Boyer was working on the 20, uh, 2090, the first hard disk controller. Um, you know, there, the software had already been written, um, and it, you know, it just it took it, it took some actual hardware to test it. That's again one of those problems of writing the software before the hardware is available. Um, I, you know, but again, I don't know exactly what the problems were. Uh, on a related note, um, so one of the things I find a little unusual is uh, a lot of them had enormous ROMs with you know a full operating system in it, or, or nearly so. And it sounds you were making choices like that as well. I'm curious if they were thinking in terms of oh well you know no this is not how it's going to go forward or or how were how were those decisions made at the time? You... Kickstart was supposed to be a ROM. Okay. Ah. Okay. It was not done in time. Mm, so okay. uh, last minute, or it was changed to uh, a disk loaded RAM system mm, because okay. uh, the the OS just wasn't done in time. Mm, yeah. it, otherwise, it would have been a ROM. Yeah, back and, at, yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. In those days, you burnt the ROM. You did. You actually had masks ROMs that were ma oh, yeah. you know, made mass production. You couldn't change mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And um, I guess the you know at, at there later on. They could actually kind of patch ROM routines, but I'm not sure. No, they no, could we back could do. Then. We could do. Back then. That was yeah, part but, of the original yeah. thing. Okay. But it was just too, too much. Far off. Yeah, too too far away from yeah, the okay. what you were really going to need. You know, obviously they wanted to ship the middle. If they'd stuck with the uh, Christmas '85, I think they could have had ROMs, mm -hmm. but not in the middle of '85. Uh, mm. Ah, okay. Yeah, and of course, you know, after after we got ROMs, everybody wanted the uh, Kickstart back, so. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, I ended up writing that for uh, in in for the MMU machines later on. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, some other computer had used all the available slots at MLS <laughs> in '85. <laughs> <laughs> so I know most people remember the Amiga as like a gaming computer, and maybe that's how it started. I worked for a company that really did use the Amiga mostly for video. We were, yeah. we were a VAR in a sense, and I was building video toasters like gangbusters like mm -hmm. for a while. And even before that, you had like Sculpt 3D, mm -hmm. and you had a lot of 3D stuff. Did that shift in the market change the shift in engineering at Commodore? Because for a lot of people, the Amiga was a gaming machine, but for a lot of people, the Amiga was a cheap SGI. It was their way. I mean, they stuck a genlock on it. They were doing titling. Did that yeah. sh did that market shift change engineering internally? Um, well, from from a software point of view, uh, somewhat uh, somewhat we'd like to do whatever New Tech wanted <laughs> <laughs> because they were uh, you know they were doing great things and. There were, uh, within Commodore, we, uh, we did see, see that you know, desktop video 
was something the Amiga was perfect for, uh, but it may have been a little too early for like the customer base. Desktop video was, you know, specialty places. Not everyone did uh, their own YouTube videos because YouTube didn't exist. Uh, so if it had been, if there had been more consumer interest, desktop video might have been a, a big thing back then. Because around around ninety, I think Harry Copperman took over, and you saw the Amiga AUX, and then you saw the Lowell board, and you saw machines that we couldn't understand why Commodore was even building. Hmm. And so yeah. we were, it was kind of like, to us, the future was desktop video, and we didn't understand why we were seeing stuff. The network boards, we, we understood. We didn't understand why, um, why we were seeing machines that weren't video related. So I guess we were very, very focused on video, and we didn't know what was going on internal yeah, the ULOL board was kind of a weird thing in that it, that had been just a small sponsoring. And, you know, occasionally they come in and show me what they were doing and I tell them, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, you know, just to, just to bus interface it, not the, not, you know, not their part of it, not their, not their TI graphics chip. But, um, but you know, it, and then it seemed like it was going to go along with Amiga Unix as something you could, but the Amiga Unix was just, you know, that was being pushed for other markets. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt to, it doesn't hurt to have your, uh, you know, to find new places to sell your equipment. Um, it, you know, in the U.S., the U.S. never quite figured out what they wanted to be. In Europe, every, you know, it was all gaming. That's all they cared about. Um, here, it was mostly the video, you know, the, the desktop video market. And so it was kind of, you know, it was, it was split a little bit just based in, in product lines, like A500, A1200 were, were for gaming, and A2000, 3000, 4000 were, were, you know, for, for video stuff. And, you know, I know we, we got, you know, even, we even had the, the 4000T with two video slots in it. Um, that, you know, the video slot was just something that George Robbins and I came up with when we were deciding what, what neat stuff we could do with this 2000 that we had inherited. Um, he was mostly staying with the 500, but I was taking all the 500 stuff, putting it in there, and thinking, what else can we do? And the slot they had, they had put had an internal slot, which kind of like their CPU slot was it was the same as the external slot. It was really just to allow you to put an internal gen lock. And I said, well, that's kind of silly because we have like all the, we have the whole. Why don't we run that over? And then George said, we should put, uh, we should run a parallel port there too. And you know, if I had it do it over again, I'd see if I could get permission to put in another CIA chip or something so it had, or some other way to control it, but at least we had some way you could, you could make it do stuff. And um, that, was, that was really with the, you know, with the idea that this will make it better for doing video stuff because I have a place to put the things that video people need that I can't build into the machine, um, you know, other than the regular slots. But it wasn't, uh, you know, I mean, there wasn't, I, you know, I didn't see a whole lot of strategy coming from the top on any of this stuff. Um, we discussed it at the engineering level, but, you know, it wasn't, it, wasn't like, it wasn't like we had a big powwow of all the, you know, all the heads of marketing and, and sales and, and management saying, you know, this is our future direction, we should do this and that. Though, we were surprisingly, in, in the chip group, we were surprisingly pushing high. Like the AAA chips, Video guys would have loved that. They were too expensive for gaming machines. At least when they, if they had come out, if they had come out in say, um, you know, 2000 when they should have, or I mean, excuse me, 1990 when they should have, or 1992 when they should have, or even 1994 when they should have. Except Commodore never spent enough money on any of that stuff, so it never ha it never got out the door. But you know, that's. Uh, <clears throat> What are you going to do? I mean, you know, they were they, you know, from the engineering perspective, we were we were pushing hard in that direction. I, you know, even with the even with the thirty-two bit expansion bus, I was, you know, I was trying to make it better for people who wanted to add stuff on that, you know, Commodore couldn't manage everything. Um, one other mistake we were making, I think, with with some of it was Commodore kept doing things that other companies could do pretty well, and we really should have spent more of our time doing things that only Commodore could do. Dave, how has it worked for 
progressing on the new Superbuster chip. Um, that kind of that kind of got stalled uh, for a number of reasons, uh, COVID and parts availability. But I, you know, I'll, I'll have to see if we'll pick that up again. Um, yeah, it was, that's a that's a that's a Buster replacement in an FPGA, um, which may be available off the shelf some point in the future. The shop, the the FPGA that is. Um, there's there's an amazing crunch on some of these parts. Um, I have I have a part in one of my systems now that uh, let's just put this in perspective. You can get the you can get this part from a from a distributor, or actually from a from a broker. Uh, from Texas Instruments, they cost about twenty bucks. It's just a little power module. Um, last summer, you could get one for about nine hundred and fifty from the broker. Um, now, I think it's gone up to about twelve hundred, fifteen hundred. No, it's twenty two hundred. That's right. The last price I heard was twenty two hundred. Uh, needless to say, I'm not using that part anymore. I made a little module that does the same thing, and my, I'm not even sure we're spending twenty bucks on it. <laughs> That's probably a three year lead time on your part, so. <laughs> Uh, not yet, <laughs> uh, but that yes, and that's, if you look those, if you look up those parts, a lot of these parts you'll have lead times going into early till mid 2023 on parts like regular everyday parts, not even something that's like super sophisticated or whatever. So I I spent all, most of last year and this year um, redesigning stuff to be able to let us use. Let us keep building what we've been building. So I mean, it's this is a this is a, this is an actual thing with parts, and I, I you know I haven't ac actually talked to Jens about this lately, but um, you, it's not the kind of thing you want to launch in the middle of a we we can't really build it issue. Um, and I had I had some other things took me away from it too. It's I'm not that's not the entire reason, but it's it's the best reason. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah. right at the moment, uh, retro computing, vintage computing is nearly perfect because it's suddenly it's the only affordable computing around. You can right? afford it, Everything. and yeah, we ha you know you can maybe you can find parts in a basement somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. I got Steph, uh, this. Is in line maybe with the Buster. If you do recreate it, um, I'm sure a bunch of Amiga fans would are wondering if there are any plans from anyone that you know in your circles to maybe do CIA chips or a couple other needed chips that seem to be disappearing and it's, might never be around ever again. It's a shame. Commodore had actually done the entire 8520 in, in, uh, in I don't know if it was in M language or VHDL or whatever, but it was, they did, they did a whole, uh, a whole um, uh, design for that to build the piece that went into um, the uh, CD32, the integrated part. So they had actually they had a big you know five hundred dollar FPGA sitting in a socket running that in the lab. But who knows what happened to that uh, that design those design files? But yeah, it's I mean so it can be done. I don't know I don't know how interesting making an eighty five twenty would be to the average uh, VHDL person. But hey, you know if you want to learn. You know, not not everybody can be uh, you know can be Jerry and design a you know entire C64 as your first FPGA project. But you know, it's it's you know you the the thing is you know you 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 get the you get the basics down. You plug it in, doesn't work. You figure out why, make some changes, doesn't work again. Figure out why. It's you know it's it's um you know it's not like you actually have to make the silicon and spend your uh you know your two hundred fifty thousand or whatever to find out you did it wrong. <laughs> You know, so it's you know, so you know, in, in that particular instance, hardware has become a lot like software. So you know that somebody somebody ought to you know. I, in fact, I haven't even looked up on open cores lately. There might be something pretty close to that that you could even pick up and customize. But you got to know what you're doing, obviously. And uh, you know, it hasn't been that hasn't been something terribly interesting. Uh, I guess, or it probably would have happened already. But you know, as the you know, there, you'd sort of want the uh, entire Amiga to be in VHDL or Verilog or whatever at this point, just because uh, you know parts aren't becoming more available. And you know, as you know, anybody, you know, if you look and you see that, you know, oh yeah, this one's they've done the entire uh, they've done the entire um, you know Amiga chipset in a pretty compatible design. Um, other, you know, smaller parts ought to be something that could be split out or put into little towers or. You know, it, it guess depends. You know, do you want do you, 
do we need to have it on a board that plugs in? Because that, that, that introduces a lot of complexities today because um, nobody's building five volt FPGAs anymore. So, you know, if you just want to plug it into a socket, you have to deal with like not, you know, the, the simple part is getting the 8520 to work at that point maybe. Um, but that's actually one of the problems doing Buster or anything else too, is that you, you know, if you want to interface with an existing system, it makes it a more, more complicated design than if you just wanted to build that functionality for something new. Did you guys name uh, any of the other boards like you did Rock Lobster? I remember the 500 was... was oh, they all, they all have names on them. I mean, the, the, the A, A, A2000 motherboard was called The Boss. Um, is that, it, well, it was a Springsteen reference. It wasn't the, you know. was from Jersey. was from Jersey. I moved out in, uh, in uh, 2016. I live in, at either end of Delaware now. So as long as there's a gap, I am serious about taking people's cards or resumes or whatever yep. for uh, software Linux device driver hackers. Uh, Good company to work for, and I could really use people. Sounds great. Yep, as well as, as long as you're willing to hire uh, people who just graduated, I think I've, I may uh, be able to deliver a few. Okay. As long as. Burnout hardware engineers. I'm good for eight bits. Yeah. <laughs> But let's see, we're nearly out of time okay. here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll ask, uh, uh, an I'll try to ask an interesting question though. All the time you remember, you know, working and developing these chips and making them work and so forth, is there one thing that really stands out in your mind as being, oh, this was just wonderful, this was fantastic. I'm sure there's a bunch of negative th stuff as well, but you know, once or twice there must have been a success, right? Yeah. Oh, I mean, for me, it's it's just the first time I get, you know, the first time the machine comes up and it's alive, you know, and um, a couple of times it was, I was the only one, you know, it's the middle of the night and I'm like, uh, you know, I like for, for the for the double A chips, it, okay, we had the dead ones and we got some new ones in and working, trying to get, you know, trying to work around the splitter bug so the operating system would run. And then it's like, okay, it's up and running, but it's not running anything new. So I sat down and wrote myself a copper list just to, build a graduated color, two or 56 colors across the screen, um, you know, oh, just, and then it's like, wow, yes, it's different. It's not the same stuff. And that was just, that, I guess that was the first, uh, the first, uh, um, you know, AGA, AA, Pandora yeah, program written. It didn't, I don't know where it went, you know, most, sure, all, sure. nobody keeps this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, there was another one when, uh, Bill will remember this one, when, when we were uh, trying to get the, uh, we put the 80 column chip in the C128, and trying to get that up and running, and I also wrote something similar to get that one going, or just, just some stuff on it, programming the registers, and I found it didn't always work, and then I found if you, if you bang the register several times, it would generally work. <laughs> <laughs> enough to get something up, enough to get yeah. a display up on the problem, and that's that's what ended up giving us that tower that went to CES. Ah, is that okay. that it was uh, it was not properly synchronized to the uh, because it's it's got its own bit clock and that comes off of a oh, you know it comes it, off of its own oscillator, and they the the hardware in there hadn't it wasn't synchronizing properly to the 6502 bus, and so or 6510 8502 bus. Excuse ah, okay. me, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually an 80, it was actually an 85 at that mm -hmm. point and uh, mm -hmm. it uh, yeah it you know so but you know if you if you if you're persistent and we we started joking about this because um, that you know Kim Ecker the designer is from Texas and previous thing from Texas was magic voice um, which we all called tragic voice and apparently in that in that <laughs> one there's also registers you have to hit twice to go so so that was the that was you know anytime you had to bang it more than once it was called the Texas register you got to hit it once to wake it up <laughs> Um, when in doubt, write twice. But just okay. yeah, but just just yeah. When you when you bring something to life. Now I didn't write the first co code that went on the AAA systems because um, it turns out there was a there was a LUT scramble there, and um, to get anything to look right on the screen, you had to run it through this filter that changed all the colors around. 
<laughs> so they, uh, the, some of the chip guys were, uh, were, had come up with that, and they, were, they had written a whole, uh, a whole little system that would allow them to, uh, to load things up on the display um, through, they were guess, I guess it was all written in ARAX. <laughs> Do you have similar experiences? I mean, you, you yeah, it's similar, similar. Uh, when I guess in the in the Commodore days, uh, the software people, uh, application guys like me, were uh, I guess the customers of the chip. So at the beginning of a chip design cycle, we get to meet with the chip designers and we tell them what we wanted, and you know they would say no, that would take too much space, or that's a terrible idea, or sometimes they'd say yeah, we could do that. So. You know, they then go away for six months doing whatever it is that they did, and then they come back after give it to a person like Dave to put it into a yeah. system, and then we get it back. And it was always like a, a Christmas surprise finding out <laughs> what it actually did when we got that. So it's like, well, you know, we want we asked for this, and huh, this is different. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it was a really nice surprise, and sometimes it was like. No. Mm, that's not useful. <laughs> not, not, not useful at all. Mm. You know. okay. um, yeah, cr Christmas is a good thing. You, you ask of this of, of Santa, and you know, he brings you something a little bit different. But, yeah, uh, yeah. It used to happen a lot. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, so, uh, it was always fun getting new peripherals, like uh, in, I guess, 80, well, 80, 82. Commodore did a, uh, from Texas actually, a voice <laughs> joystick, a voice control joystick. You could, uh, so you know, up, down, up, yeah. down, left, right. but, but uh, it was demoed for, you know, the execs, and it just didn't work. It just, it, mm -hmm. it, so it turns out that after they gave it to us in disgust, we were playing with it, it turns out you had to use a Texas accent. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 it was I was going to say it was simply, it had to be regional. You had to say yeah. left. Yeah. Uh, everything was two syllables. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay, right, yeah, yeah, I, I can't do it. I was in the, those those, in those are the fun things at Commodore. <laughs> and, you know, bring up an OS for the first time or a new hardware. That kind of stuff is always fun. Okay, uh, that does sound like a lot of fun. Yeah, working, working I guess, uh, death marches, those are fun always. Mm. Yeah. I just enjoyed you know, hitting my help self with a brick because it really feels good when you stop. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, speaking yep. of stopping, I think we are officially out of time okay. here. Okay. So please, let's thank our... our <laughs>